was a war out there. Gunshots every single night. Conservationists are the firewall between humanity and wildlife, as far as I'm concerned. There is absolutely no reason that moving forward, generations to come shouldn't have the same beauty wandering among them as we have been honored and blessed to have with us. There it is again. Whoa. Whoa. Well, that roar was incredible. Sadly, we don't hear it enough. Tigers are in desperate shape, really desperate shape. This species has declined from about 100,000 individuals at the beginning of the 20th century to around or less than 3,000 right now in the wild. When we realized tigers were going downhill, there was lots of places on the earth, wild places, where, where we didn't even know if tigers still existed. And my job was to go out and search some of the wildest places left on earth to try to find if tigers still existed. Now, one of the places which I had to explore was called Hukong Valley. My first steps into the Asian jungle were here in the Hukong. I had to reach back into my photojournalism roots because 100,000 miners had come into the area. And the jungle was no longer just the jungle. It was a large mine with a lot of people. So I needed to tell that story and the story of areas that looked like this. The point of this was, interestingly, that tigers could still live here. Tigers can live with human incursions when it's limited. What tigers cannot live with is when the human development doesn't stop and just keeps on poisoning the air and water around where they live. What tigers cannot live with is when all the people who flood in to do the development end up not only working at what they're there to do, but then killing all the wildlife in the forest in order to eat or in order to sell and make extra money. When that food gets taken away, tigers disappear without you have, having to fire a shot at, at a tiger. But unfortunately, what we are facing with tigers is the Asian traditional medicine trade. Tiger parts are incredibly valuable. Tiger bone powdered is worth more per weight than any precious metal, than any gem, than any illegal drug. The trafficking of illegal wildlife parts is now a multi-billion dollar business that has garnered finally the interest of international law enforcement organizations like Interpol because these products go along the same routes as drugs, as human trafficking. The killing of wildlife goes way beyond just killing of animals for food or even for sale. It becomes religious. It's spiritual. This is a Lisu household where the trophy board of the kills by the man of that house strengthens that house, keeps that family healthy. This is one of the last Naga shaman. This man's medicine is based on strength, is based on chi of the wildlife, is based on tigers, although he, he knows it's fastly disappearing because the last tiger he ever saw, he's wearing on his head. Well, my next story took me to Kaziranga because I felt that it was important that we look at certain parks, ones that held animals like the highest density of tigers, the largest population left of Asian elephants, 80% of the world's remaining one-horned rhinos. And in this park, I saw my very first tiger. And that's it right there. Kaziranga was an incredibly important place to investigate. About one tiger per five square kilometers. I know of no other place with that kind of tiger density. But why? Incredible law enforcement. Not only incredible law enforcement, but a shoot-to-kill policy. Now, a shoot-to-kill policy sounds terrible. 
and it's not what you want a future to be. But this is what it takes. Fortunately, tigers and other big cats are great at sneaking through the human landscape sight unseen, for the most part. A lot get killed, but a few of them make it through what's called genetic corridors in order to get to another breeding population and spread their genes. Using these kind of corridors through the human landscape is the way a small area like Kaziranga, ecologically and genetically, is not a small area. It actually becomes part of what's called a metapopulation, part of a large group of populations which have enough genetic exchange so that it's like one big population, which is just as good, if not better. Unfortunately, many big animals can't sneak through the human landscape. And sadly, the elephant is one of these. Uh, I was called and told that there was a herd that was trying to get into the park, but unfortunately there have to be a village in the way of their traditional migratory route, and this is what happens to animals that do migrate. Unfortunately, these animals are killed because of human-animal conflict. This elephant came out to join the herd, was shot with a homemade bullet soaked in acid and died of septicemia three days later as it was wandering. Rhinos are an incredible animal. And to tell you the truth, I was really kind of worried and scared about rhinos <laughs> and elephants because they charge us like almost every day. I mean, things like this. We're just taking the guards back. They had to walk. They asked us for a ride. You know, and things like this happen. It's like, what are you charging us for? But you always have to know we're guests in their park. And they finally gave up. And it's like, yeah, get out of my way. So I was always trying to find a new way to take pictures, so I put a camera on a bamboo pole with a remote control on it. And uh, so I could get a picture. I used to see guards walking next to the elephants. And I was like, let's get their view of the tusk and the trunk and take pictures. It turns out rhinos hate elephants on bamboo poles. I mean, camera. It attacked us. It, the, the elephant ran for about 500 yards. Lost the gun, lost the gun. We lost the gun. <laughs> They, they all got done going, let's go find the camera. And I said, forget the camera, go find the gun. We're stuck out of here all alone. If it wasn't for the bamboo pole, I probably would have been dead. And that was the most scared I've ever been in my life. My life is not nearly as exciting as Steve's. <laughs> Tigers are lucky in Kaziranga, too. It's the only place within all of Tiger Range where Tigers are not the number one animal which is poached. Now, that's unheard of. Because Kaziranga has the highest density of Indian rhino by far at any place in the world. They're actually poached and sought after more than, more than tigers are. This is an incredible shot Steve got. I know of no other picture ever of a tiger eating a rhino. In this case, tigers can actually take advantage if rhinos are poached and killed, because often just the horn is taken and the body's left. Everything I'd heard in Asia about tigers led me to believe that I needed to do uh, another tiger story for National Geographic. And that took us to Sumatra. Sumatra is under grave threat, mostly by their own doing. It's got one of the highest rates of deforestation in the world. A lot of people have come in and they've set up snares. There's a tiger trap with a puppy, and it's set with three snares. Most of the people are using snares. They're not after tigers. It's a really interesting phenomenon, and yet they're responsible for probably more tiger deaths or loss of tigers than anybody else. They catch what they don't want to catch, such as this tiger cub. It lost one of its legs in the snare, and it was taken in to a place of about 50 so-called conflict or problem tigers in Jakarta. Now, sadly, many tigers are meeting this fate. What's good is that they're living. However, their lives, while definitely worth something, 
is not helping wild tigers. They're dead to the wild tiger population. Tigers were, were they worth more dead than alive? I knew I didn't believe it. And with the raise in tiger numbers in Sumatra, that's not true. Because positive things are happening. Anti-poaching patrols, anti-logging patrols come in and burn out poaching and illegal logging camps. The men that used to be illegal loggers and the guy in the back elephant back there used to be a tiger poacher. Now he loves the fact that he has a job as a park guard. He gets a paycheck every two weeks. Who knows better how to catch tiger poachers than a tiger poacher? One of the only pictures of a Sumatran tiger, one of the rarest cats on the face of the earth because it has a mane. Now we're going to go to a place in one of the greatest pieces of forest in all of Southeast Asia, this area called Hoi Ka Keng by the Thai-Burmese border. That introduced me to how bad the situation was. There are almost no more tigers. Every single night, I would go to sleep, literally, to the sounds of gunfire, every night. And every morning, I would wake up wondering if anybody got shot in the night. During my study, two of my men got killed, who were unfortunately forest rangers also. Why? Because they, they had old M1 rifles. They were told to go out and shoot and, and protect against animals, pr protect against poachers when they had no training and they were fighting against people with AK-47s. I ended up stepping in a, in a trap set for, for the forest guards while I was checking, tracking tigers, and I was stepped into a, but, a bungee stick trap made like, like in the Vietnam War as bamboo stakes went through my foot. The, it, was, it was a war out there. It was a war. Gunshots every single night. We had to carry guns all of the, the time. I didn't think this area would survive, actually, and I'm an optimist. But I was wrong. I was really, really wrong. The whole government will change. And it went from having no more than a handful of tigers to having almost 100 tigers right now. And that's just in Hoi Ka King with the potential of having 500 or more tigers in the entire Western Forest complex. This population has now stabilized. Something's wrong because it's not increasing at this point. But why did that happen? That happened because the guards went from poor little local people with, with M1 rifles to guards who were trained by the people who should be training them, military people, not, not scientists. I mean, I, I actually ran training courses earlier in my career to train anti-poachers. I didn't know what I was doing. But military people and police came in and started training, and they were able to enforce the law. My job is to go get pictures of tigers. I wanted to get to Sumatra, and I got it. So I went to Thailand to try to get pictures of the Indo-Chinese tiger, another very unknown species photographically. And my job was to work with the Thai tiger team. I found that they were doing the first ever project on female tigers in history. And they first put a cow out. The tiger hits the cow, they put snares out, and then they capture the female, put a GPS collar on her, try to understand where she's going. What's her home range in different parts of the park? Does she go outside the park? But my goal was realized by getting a picture of an Indo-Chinese tiger right here at a marking tree when it's getting ready to spray. First of all, these tigers can't be seen. The ones who have survived in the forests of places like Indochina and Sumatra are those which have learned to completely stay away from human beings. So to be able to show people these pictures of these tigers around them, not bothering them, has a huge, huge impact. What you have to keep in mind, now, it's got a downside to it, too. And this downside is now being experienced here in Hoi Ka King. Because once this becomes the, the last great tiger place in Thailand, that's where the poachers come. We sometimes actually hold back our data because we know that poachers, are, once they find out that there are more tigers than people thought, that's where they're going to come. 
but we can't hold back our data. We have to publicize it. Now we go to the best known tiger landscape in the world, India. India has almost 50% of the world's remaining living tigers. First day I was there, found a down tree, hooked the camera to it, and it was up for quite a while. And this is what it did. These are the pictures that it took. Now these were taken over many days <laughs> and many hours because tigers need water. And they're very curious, like that little girl right there, the little girl. Yeah, she's not very little. And then smash her coming back in, going, I'll smash your camera again. That's my job. One of the tigers, that's all he did was uh, come in. He kind of got tired of the flash, so he'd go whack something. <laughs> camera would stop working. He did me a favor, though. He knocked it like two inches from the water and turned it upside down. And I just left it that way because it got me closer to the water. That's his dad came in for a drink. And there they are having fun in the middle of the night because they'll sleep. And then as dawn comes, they start hunting. But, but there are certain reserves which are so well protected that tigers have learned to acclimate among people so well that you could see tigers. Now, that's been good in many ways. It's been a boon for tiger tourism. It's been a boon in many ways for tiger conservation. But there's a pretty clear line between calling something ecotourism and something just becoming tourism for money. And that's the way it's gotten in many places. Tigers, when their core becomes infringed upon, they can't breed. I mean, imagine you if people were walking through your house. Could you breed? <laughs> They can't breathe, they can't mate, they can't survive if they're core. And with some small protected areas, it's become so bad that the Indian government has actually had to take up the idea of banning all tourism. Now, I don't think that's still an argument going on in India. I personally don't think it's a good idea. I think tourism is incredibly valuable, incredibly useful. It just has to be better controlled. One of the things I needed to show was lot tigers leaving the park. Only a small part of it is fenced. But human-tiger conflict is a big problem. So I put a camera on the fence. Unfortunately, Smasher pulled the cord out, but not before I got this great picture, him and his sisters and his mom going out into the village. You don't want to fence off tigers. It's not the way to do the best kind of conservation. But in these very small parks, which are surrounded by a sea of humanity, if you're going to try to prevent conflict, at least parts of the tiger's protected area has to be fenced. Unfortunately, tigers don't take well to fences. And they try whatever they can, whether they're in captivity or in the wild, to get to where they want to be going. Sadly, though, when they get through areas w which are fenced, they don't find very good things on the other side. Tigers, in this particular case, end up fighting one another due to lack of prey. And in one of the most rare situations where you'll ever see a dead tiger is when a tiger kills another tiger. But tigers are so valuable that even when the park rangers find one which was supposedly naturally killed, they don't want the local people to know. And sadly, in this case, they just burnt it so that it couldn't be seen as something of value that possibly they'd be attacked for. These are tigers mating. And of course, what you want is the result of such mating, because that's the future. And this is the, the best possible outcome you could have. There is absolutely no reason that moving forward, your children, your grandchildren, and generations to come shouldn't have the, the same beauty wandering among them as we do, as we have been honored and blessed to have with us. So let's all make that happen. Thank you very much for coming tonight. <laughs>